Welcome to SciShow Quiz Show, the only quiz show where the answers don't really matter because everybody's guessing anyway. <laughs> I'm your host, Michael Aranda. Today on the show we have Hank Green, who really just wants Giovanni to keep his effing horsepower expanders away from him and his family. I have no That's idea true. what that means. Oh, it's, you don't listen to the podcast, apparently. You gotta listen to delete this. Oh, also, okay. <laughs> it's my Twitter bio now. It's just a, it's just a sh shampoo that was mean to my wife. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, on that note, and also on the show today, we have Sam Schultz, who is maybe just a bunch of hermit crabs in a human suit. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> could be. <laughs> they're always looking for a home. They are. Inside my body, they're more than welcome. <laughs> they are. Oh. There's a lot of empty space in there, right? In your mm, body? No, not a lot. They're small. Mm, debatable. <laughs> Gas. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's also the producer of SciShow Kids and our freshly rebranded podcast, Tangents. That's Ooh. me. As a special thanks to our patrons on Patreon, we've randomly selected two of you to win some cool prizes. Hank, you're playing for Dan Heidel. Hi, Dan. Sam, you're playing for Harriet Lee. Harriet is my mom's name, so oh. I'm going to win this one for you, both Harriets. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, show our contestants what they could go home with today. Hello there, Dan and Harriet. Would you like to know what you could win today? Well, you're not here, so you can't actually answer, but I'm gonna tell you anyways. Our contestants are gonna sign their cards from the final round today, and we'll send those along to you both. But if you turn out to have been represented by the winner of the show, you're also gonna pick up a couple bonus prizes, like the aptly named I Won SciShow Quiz Show pin, and some delectable items of SciShow branded swagaliciousness from DFTBA.com. But don't worry, my dear loser, your consolation prize will make collectors tremble in awe. It's better than a 1999 first edition holographic Charizard. It's the I Lost SciShow Quiz Show pin. Howdy! All right, good luck contestants, and let's get on with the show. Okay, you both start off with 1,000 SciShow bucks. If you answer a question correctly, you win some bucks. Okay. If you answer a question incorrectly, you lose some bucks. But you never get hurt physically. Oh. We haven't tried that yet. I didn't know that that was no. In the you mix don't. At all. It doesn't happen. <laughs> okay, good. Ever. <laughs> okay, I'm the smallest one. So <laughs> if anybody's gonna get hurt, it's me. I don't know. I'm not very strong. <laughs> okay, because Sam is an artsy boy. Our first <laughs> round is all about color and light. Yes. And here's our first question. You're probably familiar with oxygen's gas form, but if you subject it to really low temperatures or super high pressures, you can create six different types of solid oxygen crystals. Mm -hmm. And one of the most intriguing types of solid oxygen is one that needs uh. the second highest amount of pressure to form. Are you with us so far? No, okay. <laughs> It'll form at room temperature if you compress oxygen to oh. more than 10 gigapascals Ooh, of pressure. A lot. Is to be lot? clear, that is <sighs> so a lot of pressure. Okay. Around 25 times more than a commercial water jet cutter, and even okay. more than the 7 or 8 gigapascals you'd need to make synthetic diamonds. I was going to ask how much stronger than a cutter it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay. So it probably isn't very surprising that this stuff is pretty drastically different than normal O2. Mm -hmm. But what exactly is so special about this form of solid oxygen? Okay. Something to do with color, apparently? Or light. Which is the same, in a way. Is it? You're very smart. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes metallic. Okay, it becomes a oxygen. superconductor. Super it turns oxygen. dark red. red or it fluoresces green. I'm just gonna say that it's metallic oxygen. That seems like a thing that might happen. Mm. <laughs> I was <laughs> wrong. Do I have to guess now? Yeah, you do. Shoot. Okay. Oh, uh, what did you guess? Metallic. Metallic. Superconductor. I'm afraid that is also <clears throat> incorrect. Yeah. Okay. It turns dark red, just like that light did. Oh. Well, we should have known that it was because it's about color. I guess so. You just think? said that. Shoot. And then you both answered something well, else. <laughs> metal also has a color. The answer is C. It turns dark red. This unique form of solid oxygen is called epsilon oxygen, and it actually has a few weird properties because of the way the atoms are arranged. The crystals are made of four O2 molecules, joined by some weak chemical bonds to form rhomboid structures. That means the electrons are arranged differently than in a bunch of independent O2 molecules which lets different bonds form and gives this crystal its unique chemical properties. For instance, epsilon oxygen has really strong infrared absorption, 
and the crystals are pretty stable across a range of higher pressures. And because of the wavelengths of visible light that this rhomboid structure can absorb and reflect, it looks distinctly dark red. Okay, next question. Even though ultraviolet light is all around us, those wavelengths aren't visible to our eyes and brains. But lots of creatures do notice when UV light is emitted or absorbed, mm -hmm. usually by flowers or other living things. Mm -hmm. Take scorpions, for example. They have specialized compounds in their exoskeleton that interact with UV and fluoresce. So if you shine a UV light on them, they'll absorb it and emit a neon blue-green glow. Hmm. Scientists aren't sure why this is a useful adaptation, no, it seem useful at all. but it it's might help like... scorpions see each other protect oh. them from sunlight, detect moonlight, or it could just be an evolutionary holdover. But they're not the only animals that glow under UV light. So the question is, which of the following don't? Oh. Okay. Reindeer. What? Oh, chameleons. Oh my gosh. Puffins or parrots? Yeah, you go first. I'm gonna guess chameleons. It seems like a trick question. Oh. I'm afraid oh. that's incorrect. Oh. So few points that I have now. <laughs> I'm gonna guess the First thing, I think they reindeer. Do. I think they reindeer. Do. No, they don't. they don't. Yeah, that seems like a really weird thing for a reindeer to do, and I was right. Seems weird for a puffin to do too. I know that some birds do it. Oh shoot! So anyway, I've that's never two heard birds. Of a, yeah. Just like a uh, I should have been using my brain the whole time. <sighs> Sam. Does anybody ever push the table over? If you get real mad, you can do that. It's glass, I think. It is. Don't, okay. don't actually. I won't do it. Okay. okay. The answer is A. Reindeer. Chameleons can change their skin color, so they're already pretty weird and amazing. But they're more colorful than the human eye can see. Turns out, patches of their skin are so thin and transparent that if you shine UV light on them, you can see bony bumps called tubercles fluoresce right through their skin. Tubercles are different across individuals and species. And because chameleons can see UV wavelengths, they probably see those patterns all the time on each other, like glowing tattoos. So researchers think it might help them find and recognize other chameleons in the forest or attract a mate. We've also found fluorescent patterns on puffin beaks and parrot feathers, which probably play a role in sexual communication and selection for them too, giving them a little extra sparkle in the eyes of a potential mate. But reindeer can only see UV light, which helps them notice things like pee or fur of other animals, or lichen to snack on on a snowy winter landscape. They don't glow themselves. The second category today is all about side effects. Both the kind you hear about from the guy at the end of the drug commercial, who mumbles things like may cause anal leakage, and just unexpected things that scientists discovered. Chemotherapy drugs are designed to mess up cell growth and division, mm -hmm. which is what you want for out-of-control cancer cells. Mm -hmm. But these chemicals aren't heat-seeking missiles that just target cancer. They damage healthy cells, too, and can be pretty rough on patients' bodies. That's what leads to side effects like hair loss, anemia, stomach problems, among other things. So, which of these unusual-sounding changes is a documented side effect of chemotherapy? Changing eye color. Mm. Losing fingerprints. What? Losing the ability to sneeze. Or developing fruity-smelling breath. The heck? Whoa! Wait. All those seem way out there! What was the first one? Changing eye color. And then they do a crime. Oh, somebody's got to push the button black. at some point. <laughs> I guess I'll push it. Oh, Somebody sorry, has I should go to. first, but you can go first. That was the most no. ginger tender was a very thing I've ever seen. I'm a gentle man. Um, the color, eye color one. I like that one. That is unfortunately yeah. correct. Uh, I gotta get one eventually. That could have been the one I said. Now I have to do it, because that's the rules of quiz show. Get it I'm wrong. gonna say get it wrong. fruity breath. Also incorrect. Ah, I know that that's a thing that can happen. Yeah. The answer was fingerprints. What? And that seems like very likely to happen to me for some reason. And then they do a crime. And they can't, can't, <laughs> they can't be found out. The answer is B, losing fingerprints. Chemotherapy drugs end up circulating in a patient's bloodstream and can affect all kinds of cells, from hair follicles to the lining of the digestive tract. And when these chemicals leak out of blood vessels in the patient's hands and feet, which are tissues that experience a lot of friction as you're living your everyday life, that can lead to hand-foot syndrome. The drugs damage skin cells, causing symptoms like redness, swelling, and peeling. And the cells that make up a patient's fingerprints can potentially be killed off too, erasing them completely. A lot of people might not notice their fingerprints disappearing. But there's one published case of a 65-year-old woman 
who couldn't finish a bank transaction because her fingerprints weren't recognizable. And now that you can do things like unlock your phone with a thumbprint, more patients might notice if those little ridges disappear. The stuff that makes tape sticky is polymers that interact with each other in whatever surfaces they're touching. There are a lot of physical interactions going on, like polymers squeezing into the texture of whatever they're sticking to, mm. and weak electrostatic forces holding molecules together. Reportedly, in 1953, a team of Russian scientists noticed a weird quirk about the physics of unspooling sticky tape. And in 2008, a team of scientists from UCLA tried peeling scotch tape in a vacuum to test it out. Ooh. Turns out, the phenomenon was true. So what happened when they peeled the tape? So this is the side effect of tape. Yes. It's a tape side effect. In a vacuum. It emitted gamma radiation. Oh, that's... It emitted x-rays. Oh, gosh. Oh. Some of the adhesive vaporized. Mm -hmm. Some of the Boring. plastic film vaporized. Boring. I'm gonna go with x-rays. It's definitely one of those two. That is ah! correct! I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> You just said you were a gentle man. I know, but <laughs> yeah. seething rage beneath Deep the surface. Deep down inside, yeah. Yeah, you can have a gentle hate. Mm. <laughs> Sam Schultz, a gentle. Hate. I get in the bath, and I think about how much I hate Hank. <laughs> <laughs> The answer is B. It emitted x-rays. Here's how the experiment went down. The UCLA researchers stuck a roll of scotch tape in a vacuum and had a machine unspool it at a speed of three centimeters per second. So pretty fast, but not unreasonable if you're wrapping presents in a hurry. And the tape emitted energy in the form of visible light and some x-rays. This phenomenon is called triboluminescence which is when some materials, like the mineral fluorite or wintergreen lifesavers, release light when they're crushed up. We're not exactly sure why this happens, but researchers think it has to do with charged particles suddenly separating, jumping back into place, and releasing a burst of light. With tape, they're even less sure how the molecules in the adhesive could be passing electrons or protons around. But the results are clear. Peeling it generated enough x-rays to image the bone in one of the researcher's fingers. Don't worry, though. These emissions weren't nearly as strong as the x-ray machines in a hospital, and they were only observed in a vacuum. So you can continue scrapbooking in peace. We're just going to call this third and final category life hacks, because okay. researchers have come up with some pretty creative solutions to problems. Like making x-rays with scotch tape. Who knew? Seems a very cost-effective way to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, also called Fermilab, is a particle physics research lab in the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's been open since 1967, and in the first couple of decades, the main ring particle accelerator was where a lot of the science happened. One of the key steps in making charged particles accelerate is a chamber with an electromagnetic field called a radio frequency, or RF, cavity. Engineers usually set up water cooling systems to keep RF cavities working properly. But if there are leaks, drips of water can build up and cause damage, which is obviously not good. Okay. On April 26, 1979, a Fermilab newsletter reported that they had used a fairly common household item to monitor for leaks in the main ring. Mm. What did they use? Kitty litter? Vaseline? Kool-Aid? Or aspirin? I'm gonna say Kool-Aid, because sometimes when you have cute, like, and it's not, it's like sort of, <laughs> because <laughs> Kool-Aid is sort of a, a light colored powder until it gets wet and then it turns into the color that it is. Incorrect. Oh, well, I have a good an explanation reason, for nothing. I'm going to say this is going to be really dumb of me to do, but I'm going to say kitty litter because it's like Kool-Aid but bigger and more of it. Also Ooh. incorrect. No. Oh, I also feel like it's cheaper than Kool-Aid. Yeah. Aspirin. What is that for? I what have is no that idea? To? Somebody's going to have to tell us. The answer is D. Aspirin. The physicists and engineers at Fermilab packed aspirin tablets for this MacGyver-like solution because they dissolve when enough water drips on them. Reportedly, in each of the 18 RF cavities that made up the main ring, they would put two aspirin tablets in holes in the bottom copper plate. Each tablet physically held open a tiny electric switch called a micro-switch. So when a tablet dissolved completely, the switch's contacts would touch and allow an electric current to flow which triggered an alarm signal in the main control room. That would let researchers know that an RF cavity needed to be patched up, and ended up preventing some serious damage. Now, that's some headache prevention. Okay, this is the second to last question, so the one before you can bet all your before bucks. Before we write okay. all this stuff down, I don't have anything left. These days, we have all kinds of wireless communication devices that rely on electromagnetism to send texts and emails. No carrier pigeons required. But 
In some situations, like in tunnels or underwater, it can be tough to send and receive signals. Sure. To work around these problems, Good. in 2013, a team of researchers experimented with a different kind of communication involving a fairly common household substance. Cool. The, process cool. isn't, <laughs> <laughs> the process isn't very efficient right now, but it was used to successfully send a chemical message across several meters. What did they use? Wait, what did you say? What kind of message? Chemical message. What is that? A chemical <laughs> message. Ooh. Do you know what that is? I mean, I, well, I mean, yeah, it's a message sent by chemicals. <laughs> Rubbing alcohol, Ugh. deodorant, Ooh. scented dryer sheets, <sighs> or liquid laundry detergent. I barely understood the question. So you go first. <laughs> I'm gonna say rubbing alcohol. That is correct. Hey, no! hey! It's almost like I I'm knew sorry. it. I didn't. Did you? No, I was a guess. Mm, you said it unconvincingly. The answer is A, rubbing alcohol. Instead of using electromagnetic signals, these researchers wanted to try sending messages with chemical signals, kind of like insects or plants would in nature. Their setup was pretty simple. There was a transmitter that translated a text message into a binary sequence of zeros and ones. It was electronically hooked up to a spray bottle. A spray meant one and no spray meant zero. Inside the bottle was isopropyl alcohol, also known as rubbing alcohol, which was chosen because it's easy to find, vaporizes easily, and is relatively safe. Four meters away was a receiver, which was set up to detect those isopropyl alcohol squirts and translate them back into letters. After a lot of small tests to set up their equipment, they successfully sent a message. Oh, Canada. Because they were testing the setup in a Canadian lab. Pretty patriotic. Okay, now we're at our final question. Hank, you have 1300 bucks. Sam, you have 600. This is still a Sounds life bad. hack of right. sorts. And before you place your bets, I'm gonna say that this is about bug bites. Okay, it's a bug bite life hack in which I am incapable of losing the game I because I have more than twice as many points as Shut Sam. Shut up, I might still win. <laughs> if everybody believes in Just me really believe. hard. <laughs> yeah. If everyone out there believes in me. Well, <laughs> while everyone places their bets, we're gonna go to commercial break probably. Welcome back, probably. Researchers studying capuchin monkeys have noticed that they share a very specific problem with us humans. Mm -hmm. They hate mosquitoes. Ah. And with good reason. Mosquitoes are annoying and itchy and they transmit diseases and parasites like the bot fly. Yeah. Even though monkeys don't have fancy labs to develop anti-mosquito technologies, they do pretty well for themselves and fight this problem using a clever natural method. What do they do? Crush leaves to release oils that attract dragonflies, which eat mosquitoes. Oh, ooh, that would be smart. Yeah. Injure small rodents and keep them nearby as a sort of blood <gasps> sacrifice. Oh, I hope it's not that one. Yeah. Squish millipedes in their fur as a chemical repellent, or add fermented fruit to standing water to kill mosquito larvae. Oh. No, couldn't be. Then who? Could it? <laughs> oh, okay. You know that? That song? Yeah, I think so. About cookies or something? Yeah. I If Sari made the one about the blood sacrifice up, I'm going to have to go give her a That's raise. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's real good. I think I'm doing this right. Okay, so you're going to reveal your answer to that camera. You're going to that camera in three, two, one. <sighs> I said millipedes. Sam said dragonflies. Dragon and I bet all my points. I bet all mine. Okay. Uh, you, well, you're both wrong. So. <gasps> <Yes>. Oh, zero! <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do it? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Everyone fool. believed in me. Hank's right. <gasps> what? I'm right. Did I, did I do it wrong on your thing? It's like that moment at the Oscars when Moonlight actually won. Mm. The winner is Moonlight. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is C. Squish millipedes in their fur as a chemical repellent. These capuchin monkeys have DIY bug spray. They find a certain species of millipede that crawls around in places like tree bark and squish them a little to freak them out. As a defense mechanism, the millipedes release toxic chemicals called benzoquinones, which are way more caustic than any commercial mosquito repellent we could buy. In fact, they're known to be carcinogenic to humans. And when a researcher tried to put some on his skin just to test it out, it was super painful and irritating. But these monkeys rub oozing millipedes all over their fur. They drool a lot, and it doesn't seem like a pleasant experience. But spreading chemicals on their fur is probably different than irritating bare skin. And it works to scare away mosquitoes. In a 2003 study, researchers tested the repellent effects of two kinds of millipede benzoquinones in a lab. They set up dishes filled with human blood, covered with thin synthetic membranes. 
some of which were treated with the toxic secretions. And mosquitoes landed less and fed less on the dishes where they had to go through benzoquinones to get a snack. So it seems like annoyance with mosquitoes is pretty universal. And maybe we can learn a thing or two from the chemicals other animals use to survive. Yeah, I just read it wrong. <laughs> we high-fived and sorry. everything. We did high-five and everything. Okay. I'm sorry, I got 2,600 points to your zero. <laughs> you tried to get zero points with me, didn't I you? Was, well, I felt like I... It, you owed it to me. I, we could work together. Yeah. So that's that's 2,600 to zero at the end there? Yeah, well, I wanted to... Sorry. I just wanted to Is see that, if I could get them... The, sorry, a big number. Yes, Is that the biggest the point spread that we've ever had? No, Maybe. probably Is this not. the biggest loss Come on. that anyone's ever experienced on no, the show ever? it couldn't be. Okay, just checking, just mm -hmm. checking. I want to play every game of Quiz Show from now on until I win. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's not the attitude you came in here with. I like it. The attitude was I'm going to win easily. Was it? Well, now this whole week angry. up until today I was. Okay. And now I'm mad. <laughs> I'm going to get revenge. Okay. Revenge. <clears throat> well, on that note, thanks for joining us for SciShow Quiz Show. Thanks to all of our patrons on Patreon. Sorry, C Harriet. Congratulations, Dan. <laughs> sorry. M Mom and other Harriet. Oh, no. I'm not. sorry. <laughs> If you'd like to support the show and get a chance to be represented on our next quiz show, you can go to patreon.com slash scishow. If you want to check out more of Sam's work, you can go to youtube.com slash scishowkids. Or if you want to listen to both Sam and Hank duke it out on tangents, you can find that wherever your favorite podcasts are uploaded. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody.